The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape Education. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation, or any part thereof, is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape Education. The following podcast is supported by an independent educational grant from Acadia Pharmaceuticals. Hello, I'm Dr. George Grossberg. I'm professor and director in the Division of Geriatric Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience at St. Louis University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome to our fifth and final episode in this podcast series on best practices in Parkinson's disease psychosis. Uh, This episode is titled, Getting Current on Data for the Management of Parkinson's Disease Psychosis and Parkinson's Disease Dementia. Joining me today, is Dr. Stuart Isaacson, who's director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center of Boca Raton. First, kind of just a reminder of the definition of Parkinson's disease psychosis. What we're looking at are the NINDS, NIMH diagnostic criteria. Initially, we need a primary diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, which is based on the UK Parkinson's disease brain bank criteria. So we start with that diagnosis. In order to qualify for psychosis in Parkinson's disease, we need to have at least one of the following symptoms. Hallucinations, most often visual, or delusions, most often paranoid or accusatory, illusions, and then a false sense of presence. The symptoms occur after a Parkinson's disease diagnosis and need to be recurrent, almost day-to-day or continuous for at least one month. We know that about 50% or more of Parkinson's patients will experience psychotic symptoms during the course of their disease. We also know that Parkinson's disease psychosis is associated with decreased activities of daily living, with a higher risk of depression, lower quality of life, increased caregiver burden, and most importantly, increased nursing home placement, morbidity, as well as even increased mortality. So obviously it's something that we want to recognize and treat promptly and effectively. Now, as far as recommendations for treatment, the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society recommends, like all of us recommend, non-pharmacologic approaches should always be tried first. But if the non-pharmacologic approaches are not working and the patient's quality of life is dwindling or if they present potentially a danger to self or to others, then there may be pharmacotherapies, some of which are more effective than others. The society looked at four drugs and the data that we have relative to these four drugs. The first drug was clozapine. Clozapine is indeed effective for Parkinson's disease psychosis. It seems to be a relatively safe and well-tolerated drug, but only, only with rigorous monitoring for agranulocytosis, which involves weekly blood work for the first six months and then monthly thereafter. So it's not an easy drug to use, but can be clinically useful in Parkinson's disease psychosis. Olanzapine was found to be not effective and really could make the Parkinsonian kind of symptoms worse. So it was felt that the risk was not acceptable. Quetiapine may be a useful drug. The problem is we don't have enough data. So the risk may be acceptable. There's no need for specialized monitoring. It may be possibly useful, but we really need more data. Pimavanserin was found to be efficacious and indeed it is approved for this indication with acceptable risk without need for specialized monitoring. So this is kind of the scenario for Parkinson's disease psychosis. Now, Stuart, tell us a little bit about the mechanisms of action of these drugs and some of the latest data that we have. Well, thanks. That's a really uh, wonderful uh, overview of some of our knowledge and some of the recommendations from this evidence-based review. And it really reflects our understanding of the mechanism of action of antipsychotics. You know, all these antipsychotics, the first generation, the second generation, typical, atypicals, all block dopamine 
D2 postsynaptic receptors. And, and this is thought to be integral to the antipsychotic effect for, for a very long time. Of course, in Parkinson's disease and that dopamine depleted brain where patients have already lost about 50% of striatal dopamine, they're probably very, very sensitive to any type of antagonism of these dopamine D2 receptors and readily uh, develop this problem with, with uh, increased Parkinsonism and, and motor symptoms. So when we think about the first generation of conventional antipsychotics, these primarily block dopamine D2 receptors, but they also block a number of off-target receptors. And these can lead to off-target side effects, which are particularly troublesome in people with Parkinson's who already suffer non-motor symptoms reflecting more widespread degeneration in the Parkinson's disease a neurodegenerative process. You know, when the atypicals uh, emerged, uh, we were really hopeful that these would be helpful in our patients with Parkinson's disease psychosis because they seem to have less affinity or, or less uh, receptor occupancy, at least, at the postsynaptic D2 receptors. And they also block serotonin 2A receptors. Uh, clinically, we saw less Parkinsonism emerge in patients without Parkinson's disease. But unfortunately, in people with Parkinson's disease, all the atypical antipsychotics block dopamine D2 receptors, and they all worsen motor Parkinson's and Parkinson's disease patients, except for clozapine and, and quetiapine and, and, and now pimavanserin. Now, clozapine and quetiapine uh, block dopamine D2 receptors, but they seem to have less uh, possibility of causing motor impairment. Uh, pimavanserin does not have any affinity to the dopamine D2 receptor, and hence we wouldn't expect it to have uh, motor impairment. But probably equally importantly is that the off-target side effects uh, are, are not thought to be present with pimavanserin because it doesn't have other affinity to other receptors uh, off-target or on-target. seems to predominantly uh, in, have inverse agonism activity and antagonist activity at the serotonin 2A receptor, perhaps a bit at the 2C. Clozapine was evaluated in two randomized placebo-controlled trials. Uh, both of these were four weeks in duration, and both of these uh, using uh, validated scale demonstrated improvement in psychosis symptoms and without worsening motor symptoms in these four-week trials. Uh, somnolence was seen in over 50% of the patients, though, and orthostatic hypotension in almost 20% of patients. Quetiapine, on the other hand, has not been subjected to large randomized placebo-controlled trials. Anecdotally, it seems to have an antipsychotic effect, as one would expect from an antipsychotic, but in several smaller trials, uh, clear efficacy versus placebo was not consistently demonstrated. Uh, contrary, perhaps, to some of our anecdotal experience, one trial actually demonstrated and suggested motor worsening in, a, in some of the patients. Orthostatic hypotension and somnolence can be limiting uh, to titrating to effective doses. And many of these patients uh, who do respond to quetiapine use a low dose. Uh, Pimavanserin in a six-week pivotal trial uh, demonstrated on a validated scale significantly improved symptoms of psychosis, hallucinations, and delusions. There was no worsening of motor symptoms. Uh, somnolence was not significantly increased over placebo, and orthostatic hypotension was actually less common in the primavanserin-treated uh, patients. Somewhat uh, very unusual in trials of any psychosis in that this study of primavanserin and Parkinson psychosis, 14% had a complete resolution of all psychotic symptoms compared to about 1% in placebo. Since that time and the commercial approval, a lot of work has gone on to, to sort of understand what does this mean clinically? Uh, to our patients. And we tried to, to see, because as an atypical antipsychotic, it shares the boxed warning for increased mortality in elderly patients uh, with dementia-related psychosis. Uh, do we have evidence of, of uh, concerning safety and mortality? So there have been a number of studies looking at Medicare databases and some meta-analysis. For instance, one study evaluated the efficacy and safety of primavanserin compared with placebo in a meta-analysis of four trials. Uh, they demonstrated in this meta-analysis a significant reduction in hallucinations and delusions using those subscales of the, of the validated SAP scale, and no change in the motor symptoms using that UPDRS scale. And it seemed to be protective against hypotension. Another uh, study was an observational study that looked at 
a Medicare database and compared who initiated on Pimavanserin, over 3,000 of them, uh, versus over 18,000 who were initiated on a different atypical antipsychotic, uh, quetiapine being the most common of that group, about 78% of patients. And they looked at the, uh, the first 180 days after initiating and then found that the mortality was actually th approximately 30% lower with Pimavanserin than with the other antipsychotics. This translates to about one excess death per 30 antipsychotic treated patients. Uh, beyond 180 days um, or among nursing home residents, uh, this difference uh, did not persist. Another retrospective cohort study that was based on a large commercial insurance database of new uses of pimavanserin, about 775, uh, versus quetiapine and clozapine, about 4,500 patients and other antipsychotics, uh, about, about almost 1,300 patients. And then looking at these three groups, there was no difference in mortality risk between pimavanserin and other antipsychotics. Uh, more recently, there's been a, a systemic review and meta-analysis that aimed to compare the efficacy, the safety, uh, and the acceptability of pimavanserin, quetiapine, uh, clozapine, lanzapine, zaprasidone, and risperidone. This looked at 19 studies that had been performed in Parkinson's disease psychosis. And using clinical global impression scales for severity, uh, CGIS, uh, pimavanserin and clozapine uh, were noted to significantly improve peak Parkinson's psychosis symptoms compared with placebo. Uh, pimavanserin also improved psychotic symptoms based on the SAPS PD score, but again, that was the only study that that, that use that. Uh, clozapine, quetiapine, and pervanserin all did not worsen motor function in this meta-analysis, although quetiapine significantly impaired cognition uh, based on many mental uh, scores. Another uh, uh, systemic review and a Bayesian network meta-analysis analyzed 17 studies assessing efficacy as well as safety based on UPDRS and, and AE dropouts and found that clozapine and pervanserin were both efficacious um, uh, they had low impact on, on worsening motor function, and that dropouts because of AIDS had an odds ratio of 2.9 for, for clozapine and 2.2 uh, for pimavanserin. Uh, another study recently looked not at mortality, but at other important factors for people with Parkinson's disease who have a progressive worsening of motor function and hence are at risk of falls. And they also looked at hospitalizations. And this cohort study looked at 112 patients who initiated pimavanserin and almost 1,000 who were initiated on clozapine, quetiapine, risperidone, olanzapine, aripiprazole, and brexpiprazole. And what they found was that the incident rate for falls and fractures was much lower for pimavanserin, 17.8 versus 40.8 for the comparators. Uh, it was unknown if this reflected orthostatic hypotension or worsening Parkinsonism leading to falls, but it was a significant difference in falls and fractures. When we looked at the match incidence rate ratio, they found an incident rate ratio of 0.71 for pimavanserin versus uh, the comparative initiators. Another one looked at healthcare utilization and mortality in a retrospective cohort study. They found that 12.1% of patients with Parkinson's psychosis use long-term custodial care within one year of being diagnosed with Parkinson's psychosis. Uh, this is a relative risk of 3.38 for long-term custodial care and 1.34 for death. Uh, the healthcare utilization and costs were higher for patients with Parkinson's psychosis than for those without, uh, suggesting that people with Parkinson's disease, once they develop psychosis, are very different than other Parkinson's disease patients. This study I looked at 844 new pimavanserin users and compared them to 2,500 uh, new quetiapine users to assess hospitalization and mortality. They found that the adjusted um, risk for hospitalization uh, was much lower for pimavanserin, uh, 0.59 at 30 days, 0.56 at 90 days, 0.63 at 180 days. And in a year period, uh, the uh, the risk was 0 0.70 for pervanserin versus quetiapine. The most common reasons for hospitalizations was traumatic injury, probably resulting from a fall and, and sepsis uh, from an infection. Hospitalizations for heart-related issues seemed higher with pervanserin, though, and the adjusted 
hazard ratio for all cause mortality uh, favored pimavanserin, 0.73 at 90 days, 0.80 at 180 days, and at one year, 0.94. And this augments the recent publications of the long-term extension trials that uh, were carried out after the pivotal trials and uh, looking out over seven years in some patients that really demonstrated a no new safety or tolerability concerns. It augments the information that the FDA has published uh, that they did not find uh, new things in the commercial realm. George, do you have any data for patients who also have Parkinson's disease dementia? Uh, thank you, Stuart, for that comprehensive overview. So just to kind of briefly look at Parkinson's disease dementia patients who are also having psychotic symptomatology, the International Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Society recommendations looked at basically the three cholinesterase inhibitors in wide use, uh, denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine, as well as the NMDA receptor antagonist, memantine. And what they found was only rivastigmine uh, was in fact efficacious, uh, had acceptable risk without need for special monitoring, and indeed was clinically useful. And this resulted in FDA approval for rivastigmine as a treatment for patients with Parkinson's disease dementia. Rivastigmine in patients with Parkinson's disease dementia with or without psychotic symptoms or hallucinations was looked at in a large study of 536 patients. And it was found that rivastigmine significantly improved neuropsychiatric inventory or behavior scores, whether psychotic symptomatology, as well as agitation and aggression. In fact, there was greater therapeutic benefit seen among patients with hallucinations. We also have a sub-analysis of the Harmony study with Pima Vanserin, which focused on Parkinson's disease psychosis, where we looked at a little over 15% of those patients in that study also met criteria for Parkinson's disease dementia. And these patients, in fact, also responded quite well versus placebo. Uh, their likelihood of relapse was 13% in the Pima Vanserin group versus 28% more than double risk for relapse in the placebo group. Let's keep in mind that there were some adverse events with Pima Vanserin, a headache, constipation, UTI, and asymptomatic QTC prolongation. So as we finish up, Stuart, I just wanted to get your input on a case I had very recently in the clinic. Uh, this is a gentleman in his late 70s with moderately advanced Parkinson's disease who's been having really, really dramatic psychotic symptomatology that are really impairing his quality of life and the quality of life of his care partner. Uh, I actually started him on, on Pima Vanserin. He's been on the optimal dose of 34 milligrams for three to four weeks now. We're seeing a very marginal effect a minimal effect. So what are the, the treatment options for this individual? If, if this was your patient in your clinic, what would you be thinking about? So it's, it can be a very difficult situation because we're trying to balance both uh, maintaining good control of motor symptoms, especially reducing the risk of falls and also treating psychosis symptoms. So we know with Pimavanserin that we see the full effect by six weeks. And we don't see a greater effect by 10 weeks or later. Patients uh, had more improvement from four to six weeks. So I'd be hopeful uh, primarily that there'll be an increasing effect over uh, until six weeks. I think that we have to look at his Parkinson's medicines. I think the, in Parkinson's psychosis, we think perhaps in many patients, there's a serotonergic 2A overactivity, sort of the fire burning. And then the dopamine drugs adds fuel to the fire. So maybe temporarily we can take away some of the fuel of the dopaminergic medicines if they tolerate it uh, motor-wise. Uh, so that would be a second thing. It can be difficult in the short term, perhaps we have to add or change the medication. We know that clozapine uh, has a demonstrated efficacy, but requires blood monitoring uh, to get it to a registry before they can get it. So it may take you several weeks. So this is a patient I might uh, begin to think about the registry for clozapine and get that underway so that if after six weeks, there's not a good effect from Pimavanserin, we can think about switching it and be ready to get it. And then sometimes we add quetiapine uh, to the Pimavanserin. Because Pimavanserin only blocks 2A, 
it might allow us to use a lower dose of a different antipsychotic. Sometimes we give from advanced for the, in, uh, in the morning and in quetiapine at night. Unfortunately, we don't have any data to suggest the safety or, or interactions, but we wouldn't think there would be any. We know both can prolong QTC, uh, quetiapine by six to eight milliseconds on average, from advanced for five to eight milliseconds. This might be additive. So sometimes we'll check an EKG and make sure that their range is below or closer to 400, so they don't approach that 500 millisecond threshold. But often I would eat, I would add a low dose of quetiapine at night uh, and hope that that would be temporary and that the uh, prevention will continue to improve. As time goes on, we have some empiric medications. You mentioned rivastigmine. Uh, we often add that. Uh, there's been some work with ondensetron and other medicines, and we look forward to other non-dopaminergic medications. Uh, the TAR1 agonist that's under development. We've looked at that recently in Parkinson's psychosis and found some, some hope. Um, because when you look at the 25% of patients in the PIM of in pivotal trial that did not have improvement, because there's such a, uh, a high affinity serotonin 2A receptor inverse agonist, we might assume that those patients are not driven by serotonin 2A. They must be driven by a different uh, network of causing psychosis. So I think about that as well. That's a great discussion. I appreciate that. The only thing I would add is that we'd be also thinking about thinking about electroconvulsive therapy if all else fails. But thank you again, Stuart. It's great to have you uh, with us. I want to thank our audience for participating in this activity. And please continue to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation.